This is a nightmare. <laughs> it was kind of a fun night in a weird way. We rehearsed that for months and months leading up to it. Ultimately, it's like a dance. It's like choreography. It was really cool. And you're like, OK, let's do this. Episode six was one of the big leaps for us because you're not only jumping forward 10 years in time, but you're recasting, <laughs> you're recasting the show midway through. We always spoke of it as our second pilot. You come in on Rhaenyra giving birth and then the slow reveal being that this is her third and that much time has passed. There's a 10 year time jump. You see her now husband, Laner, Harwin Strong. He's the actual father of all of these children. Viserys is slowly deteriorating, and Alicent, meanwhile, is strong and in her prime and sort of running things. There's a lot of ground to cover. Making a determined time jump and then changing the main cast was just a brilliant way to do it. We talked a lot about who should shift into being older versions of themselves, and we felt that Rhaenyra, Alicent, Lena, and Lainor were important. They were all interacting with each other heavily and, and they had experienced that passage of time together and it was a good way of grounding the time jump. The Queen has requested that the child be brought to her immediately. Why? I remember the phrase that Ryan said about Rhaenyra, which is she needs to be punk rock, non-conventional. You're looking at the Targaryen line, you're looking at the Amelia Clark Association further down the line. You know, you're looking at the woman who set everything in motion, and that has to be a force of nature. Somebody with intelligence and feels otherworldly, and that's Emma. Emma does not fit into a slot that is easy. Emma is such a striking, unique presence. When I first saw them in the audition, it was like I couldn't imagine the role being played by anybody else. With Alicent and Rhaenyra, we were focusing on the adult versions first. I had to keep reminding everybody the people that were going to be leading the charge were going to be their younger versions. Millie Alcock, she read and it was just a gift from the gods. We were very lucky. She is a remarkable version for younger Emma. I see them in the costume and I'm like, is that what I'm gonna? I look great. Rhaenyra. You should be resting after your labors. Olivia is probably the most seasoned actress of them. We wanted her in the show. She did such a strong audition. We got Olivia to read for Rhaenyra as well, and she did astonishing reads for both of them. It became clearer that she would be better suited to Alicent. And certainly once we'd met Emily, the pair of them were wonderful. Olivia, I've been in awe of her work for years, and so to play the younger version of her is a blessing. And Miguel and Ryan had said, Alicent is probably the character that changes the most in that time jump. There are multiple things that we both portrayed through Alicent that connects the two characters together, but where my Alicent leaves and where hers begins, they are almost completely different people. If Rhaenyra comes into power, your very life could be forfeit. I do feel like we lucked out with our Alicents and our Rhaenyras. I think for me, it's always about the energy. Millie and Emily reflected the energy of Emma and Olivia. The show is very demanding just in terms of the sheer number of actors, but also the quality of the performer because they're deeply nuanced roles. Kate brought forward an amazing pool. It took a lot of doing, but we were able to put together a hell of a cast. Oh boy, I just heard. Yes. Well done. In order to play Leonor as we find him in episode six, I really had to know exactly who he was before the time jump. But I was cast first and started filming. I looked up and I saw this person walk in. I looked at him and then he looked at me. We seen each other across the room. Else. I said, are you me? And he went, yes. <laughs> I had some talks with Miguel and he gave me a few treats about the character that he would say to the other girls as well, I think. There are similar things that I'm guessing they'll say to all of us about our characters. I haven't met them. So it's gonna be exciting to see who they are and how they interpret the character. I've never done the part where I've shared with an actor before. 
I have to meet them. And Miguel was like, yeah, 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 and never set it up. So I was like, I think this is a strategic move um, on their part. It is a complicated thing because even when you're not kind of watching that work, you are building something together. When I'm queen, I will create a new order. It was really important that Miguel direct episode six to set the tone for the time jump because the visual tone of the show changes and becomes less original Game of Thrones and more specific to House of the Dragon. We made the decision that instead of jumping between characters as you normally would, to stay with each character for a much longer time so you could settle into their world and into their head. I think it just roots you into each of their worlds and where they are right away. It was new actors playing new roles. We were going to spend more time with the characters actually moving with them. We're saying to you, this person that you got used to, Millie, is no longer Rhaenyra, she's Emma. We wanted our audience to have an opportunity to really examine that particular actor and uh, feel comfortable with them. And this seemed like a really good way to do it. For five episodes, an audience have sat with this person, have fallen in love with this person, have developed affection for them, and then suddenly I'm going to walk in and change their face and body and tell them to like me. You come in on the back foot, in a way. The moment Rhaenyra gives birth until she meets Alicent was not in the original script. She wants to see him. Now? I thought, well, if we're going to have this set, I would like us to inhabit it properly, which is why the opening actually follows our characters in a single continuous take all the way through. <sighs> we are turning back, all right? <laughs> we needed to come in on this relationship that you completely bought, and I don't think there's any other way of buying it than spending time with them. What happy news this morning. Indeed, Your Grace. We needed everybody to kind of jump in. And the feeling is if, if you can hang in for the first 20 minutes and realize what's going on and follow it, then you'll be in for the ride. Well, we know that we've got the two characters, so we have to take elements of one across to the other and vice versa. And you do it to make it look practically the best that you can. We used elements of some of the very early episodes of the plaiting. The wig is obviously of the same colour palette. It's lots of little things that we do. Things like eyebrows, a lip shape. I normally find a mole or a freckle or something and, and continue that across. We go for a more youthful look to get the changeover between cast. Working with Olivia, it was really interesting to see the development of the character having jumped on the years. And when we see her, she's a really confident queen. We used fantastic fabrics on her, really luxurious and extravagant. And it just carried on the involvement of the character. Six Bravo Tech 2, come on board on Echo and Golf. Action. The change of age, the change of social situation. I dressed up Millie and I dressed up Emma. They are two different personalities, two different actresses, because it's a difference between a, a teenager and a woman. The thing that I really like about it is that actually when I think about myself as a younger person, I don't always recognize them or I perceive them to be a different person to the one I am now. I think the poetry and the form is that there's obviously lots that carries through, but we allow that younger self to be a different person to an extent. Emma Darcy and Olivia Cook's portrayal of Rainier and Allison are so compelling that I think you have no choice but to buckling up and going along for the ride. We're in Pentos because I really wanted to shoot something in Spain and uh, gradually I was talking myself out of doing any of the fun stuff on this show uh, and generally getting stuck in like a quarry in Belfast, which is where I usually spend most of my time shooting. So we had seen these photos of this beautiful Moorish castle in Spain. I love that castle from the first time Jim showed us pictures of it because it looks like something from Game of Thrones because the exterior is Moorish and the interior is sort of Italian revival and it's a fantasy place that's real. 
when I saw the castle, I was like, where is it? And then you see it up on a hill and it was just beautiful. It's something when you're on location that's just special. I think it's important. I think a show like this, a lot of it is studio based. And I think the more big, grand location stuff you can do, the better, really, because it needs to feel outdoors and it needs to have scale. To Egon the Conqueror, your exalted forebear. Egon the Conqueror. To Egon the Conqueror. It is a, a stunning location, and when you come here, because it's such a solid-looking castle, you've got no idea how ornate the interior is. So we wanted to preserve that surprise, if you like. In some ways, as a concert artist, you can relax a bit, because the architecture is already there, it's already sort of been designed for you, you know, so it's just a case of recreating it. Somewhere as old as that, the first time that was seen, birds had been living in it for years and years and years, so it needed a real thorough kind of hazmat clean. We had to paint the whole thing, we painted all the walls with darker tones. We built library shelves in there and turned the whole kind of top floor of the um, courtyard into Damon's library. We created about 2,000 books in the end, but we cheated it because you only see the front 50 mil of the spine, and we would cast them out in biscuit foam, which is a lightweight material, and the finish is, is what makes it, really. You, you couldn't tell they weren't full books in the end. The library was quite challenging, but the beauty of it is when the light comes through down the centre of the courtyard, the light that hits all the different furniture and colour and leather and texture and fabric. It was beautiful, absolutely beautiful. They are using us. Refreshing, isn't it? The art department did an amazing job that it looked so natural and it looked that it's always been there, that at the end they ask if they can keep it. <laughs> You have to work around the health and safety elements there that, you know, people will fall through the floor if you have too many people in that corner. Um, but we made it work and we have to believe it as we found it, short of putting the bird shit back in, so, <laughs> <laughs> Six was written by Sarah Hess, and Sarah and I have worked together uh, before on House. She actually wrote the first episode of television that I directed. It was about getting away from where we had been. Pentos is effectively, you know, it's kind of, it's Morocco, it's, it's, a, it's Ibiza, it's like, it's somewhere f far away that's kind of nice and you don't really need to come back from. It was a little, just an island where we were doing all these scenes and it really felt in that moment like we were far away from everything and making this little domestic drama and yeah, it, it has a really interesting feeling to it that I think is different from everything that's come before it. We are not minstrels or mummers who play at the pleasure of an alien prince. The Pentos story in episode six is a bit of a short film. So much was going on in the Westeros side of the story that we only had so much time to d devote to it. So we were like, okay, what are the three or four key beats that we have to hit and how do we dramatize them in a super efficient way that feels like you're moving through a story quickly, but not that just that you're ticking boxes as you go along. At this point, that felt natural. So I think yeah. you do it until, you know, let's do the same thing. When it's yeah. Yeah. Honestly, I mean, I, I can say this because I didn't write it, Sarah wrote it, but it's one of my favorite sequences in the whole show. But you are more than the state. The man I married is more than this. Everyone knows that Harwin is in fact the father of Rhaenyra's children. No one will admit it because the king has decreed that it isn't so, and this is an opportunity to push Harwin's buttons. Harwin Strong is from the Riverlands. That's where the trident all intersects. He's known to be an incredible knight. Strangely enough, they call him Break Bones because I think he has a reputation for breaking a few bones. Rowley choreographed quite an elaborate fight between them, and I came and had a look and said, no. Most fights are over pretty quickly, and if someone like Harwin, who we've established as being a one-punch kind of guy, if he lays into you and you are unprotected, it's over. Your interest in the princeling's training is quite unusual, Commander. Most men would only have that kind of devotion toward a cousin or a brother. Or a son. Harwin gets baited and he takes the bait. It was really stupid. <laughs> 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 
is really an impulsive reaction to the threat of his family. There's a good! Even though he's very adept at fighting back, Cole does not fight back. He takes the blows because he wants to expose Harwin and Rhaenyra for what they are. No, it doesn't matter. Ryan and Fabian fight really well. They're skilled and they listen. That's the key to it, you know. It, there's no arrogance there. It, it, they're really easy to work with and really easy to deal with. I remember when I first got cast, I was sort of like, you know, I said to my agent, I was like, you know, the stunt stuff I want to do myself, the sword stuff, and uh, let me do it. Like, I'm happy to do it. I regretted that two weeks in after like a couple of hours boxing training with Rowley, heaving over in the corner trying to catch my breath or like on take 50 of trying to swing a punch. It's, um, it's a lot harder than it looks, but ultimately it's like a dance. It's like choreography. And then doing that dance a number of times once you get there on set. We are generally working with actors that have not had four or five seasons of experience on previous seasons. These guys are all kind of fresh out of the box, especially the children, so you're, you're teaching them from scratch. Ryan was helping me get into that moment. After seeing it, it was really cool. It was great working with the kids. They're just happy to be there. Is there anything greater? You're getting paid money to go skip school and learn to fight with swords. Say something, say something. <laughs> when children are involved, it's, it's a totally different situation from when we're dealing with adults. Every attempt in every situation is done to make everything safe, whether it's adults or children. There's always that sort of pang of uncontrol when you're handing a uh, rubber weapon to a child. We've done our fight scene and we, we rehearsed that for uh, months and months leading up to it um, and it went really well, it was great. We've been working with Rowley and, this, and the whole stunts team and so we've been like training and stuff and learning and we've also done rehearsals so I'm pretty, I'm pretty set I think, hopefully I should get it right on the day. All these scenes are like so cool. As an actor, you know, you, you don't get many shows where you get to be with a dragon or like fight with swords. So it's going to be awesome. Those stunts are so well choreographed by the stunt team and Rowley, and they are amazing. I mean, they showed us multiple times that day and before. And just seeing them do it, I was inspired to be as good as I can be in that scene. Yeah, I mean, it's what you dream about, really, as a kid. I mean, I remember being the age of, like, five to six and younger, dreaming about being that sword fighter and that hero or villain, you know, fighting against my mates or my bullies. What are you doing? You broke our shot. Fabian, you ruined the shot. What are you doing? Laris found an opportunity where it'd be quite good to maybe get rid of some members of his family, and he can't do it himself. So he finds desperate people who have nothing to lose, so he goes into the dungeons where he works, and he finds three prisoners, and he gives them the option that you can either stay here and die, or you can come work for me and do some dirty work. I am prepared to offer you mercy if you're prepared to pay a little price. Originally written as the whole of Harrenhal Burns, reduced to a set which was not fire retardant, so we couldn't actually burn anything in it, and that somehow it worked. So we were looking for some way in which we could bring this all together. What if they're just both on the other side of a door, and all we make is the door? and the back wall, and we ended up with the scene we have. Cowan! We're bringing up the fire effect, so we see a little bit of fire and flame. So we just use a couple of flame bars, a bit of a smoke machine. I did some additional lighting to push some of the warmer light through the cracks of the door, so you're suggesting a bit of fire. So you never actually see anyone burn, and we just did some very simple flame in the foreground of the camera, of the foreground of the shot. Gavin was given at least six proper raw iron rods to bang the door with, and he literally bent every single one, which was quite impressive. They gave me a rubber fire poker, and I'm hitting this, this door, and it just, just looked like a wobbly fire poker. So they gave me a metal one, and 
you know, because you're in the moment. I was smashing the absolute SHIT out of this door, and I bent this proper metal poker in half, screaming at my son, and I lost my voice. I've broken the prop, I can't speak. This is a nightmare. <laughs> so we, we did quite a few takes of that, um, which, of course, Miguel likes to keep pushing you to the limit. And uh, he kind of did that day. Uh, well, I am. Uh, the actor has uh, disabled the door. Very sad ending for both of them, but it'll make Laris a wonderfully hated villain. And me and Gav both joke about, uh, you know, we're, we're, if, they need, if they need a ghost of Harrenhal or someone else in the rubber mask, we can always come back with that later. Originally, we weren't sure which episode Harwin and Lionel were going to die in. It was maybe going to be seven. We weren't sure where to put it, and we had two deaths by fire, which felt like it was either going to be too many deaths or you just put them together and, and make it a thematic side-by-side -side thing, which ended up being the best way to go. Well, Lena made it very clear to us, I think, earlier in the story that she doesn't she doesn't want to go out the prescribed way. She's a dragon rider. She rides the most fearsome dragon on earth, and she wants to she wants to die a dragon rider's death. I don't think she means tonight, <laughs> but you know, in, in Game of Thrones, you never know when uh, when the stranger is going to come knocking. I've reached the limit of my art. So I feel like the last scene with Lena, when she decides to die by a dragon, is actually the scene where we see that she takes control of her life the first time. That's kind of the scene, like, this is, I am going to decide how I will die. I'm not going to die by some blade of some Pantoshi surgeon. I'm going to die by my dragon, because I'm a dragon rider. It's like her going out with a bang. It's funny, you know, because people always say, oh, that must have been a really heavy scene to direct. And I always think to myself, oh, this is going to be a really heavy scene to direct. But generally speaking, one of the things that lots of actors are incredibly good at doing is when they're doing emotionally wrought, especially kind of uh, distressing, disturbing scenes, they find a sense of humor and levity that gets them through it, and that's infectious, and it creates a very good atmosphere on set, and this was no exception. When Miguel was talking to me with the scene, he was like, so you imagine, you know, you see Vagar, you can imagine that truck standing there, that's like Vagar, and then he was like, no, that's Vagar's face. She is huge. Just to imagine like this enormous dragon in front of you was kind of hard. And then you have this guy standing with a stick and a tennis ball and like, that's Vegar's eye. And you're like, okay, let's do this. I'm happy with the scene, but it was tough. It was windy, it was cold, and I was barefoot on all the stones and it was blood coming everywhere. But you just do it. In those kind of circumstances, you just go, okay, this is so weird but I just have to. They are Dragaris. Ah! Dragaris! It's another one of those scenes where it's a human and a dragon interacting, and it's such an emotional scene. I'm really hoping they're just absolutely devastated. Dragaris. We had a special effects rig up on top of um, a bit of scaffolding that would blast flames, but obviously we couldn't do that with Nana in there. So she would do her performance, we did all of her coverage, and then we would get her out of the way, and then there was a representation of her body shape out of uh, what looked like a knight. <laughs> it was all steel. It had a wig and it had its own costume. Uh, it was doused in fuel, and then the special effects boys took great pleasure in, in blasting it with a flamethrower. Long action. I was laughing when I saw that when they put her on fire. I was like, that's me, but it looked <laughs> it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting to see how they managed to put all the you know different parts together. We, we used a tool there called Cyclops, which is Unreal-based software that works on an iPad. So you, you know, the Apple iPad has its own motion sensors in there, and it uses that. You can load the, uh, a scene in, and that scene can be a dragon, if you want it to be, and use it as a framing guide. That, you know, if you tilt up here, 
that's where Vegar's head will be. So uh, we tried two things. We tried one, actually putting a, an iPhone-based version of the app on the camera, but most of the time, it actually was me. I would sort of kneel down by the camera with my iPad and discuss with the camera, look, if you point this way, you'll be seeing Vegar here. And Angus has, has done a lot of prep work on those kind of scenes. So he comes knowing the, the lenses that he wants to use and the camera angles and the distances. And we kind of work with him on that. And the SFX guys have got the flamethrowers and the torches. It was a, it was kind of a fun night in a weird way. <laughs> we had a, a wonderful SFX technician. He had made this incredible flamethrower that he was very excited about and we almost couldn't get the flamethrower out, which was going to be really sad, because I would have had to report back to him. Sorry, didn't use flamethrower, but instead we did. It was a very interesting experience, and surprisingly, came out quite well. And three, two, one, action! I remember I was very nervous coming and doing that rehearsal, and I remember leaving that. I was like, this is going to be fun. That was a nice memory.